If anyone has personified the power of positive thinking, it's this man. 34-year-old ex-mayor, former DJ turned media magnate, Andre Rajawelma. On the back of anti-government protests, he suddenly declared himself president of Madagascar and appointed a prime minister, Munja Rondefo. For now, they are lords of nothing. Within a fortnight, they'll be ruling the country. It will be a textbook coup against an elected president with two years left on his term. Is it worth it? Why not just wait for an election? Because more people will die, it's very clear now. Well, and the, the question normally should be asked to him. Does it worth to kill people in order to, to continue this system? That is the question. When President Mark Ravalo Manana was elected in 2002, he promised to fire up the Malagasy economy with new foreign investments. To some extent, he succeeded. He also succeeded in firing up a lot of his own companies and becoming massively rich in the process. Nevertheless, he was re-elected in 2006. Ravalo Manana may have become greedy or even corrupt as the opposition accuse, but he was no Idi Amin. His power wasn't soaked in blood until a horrific shooting outside his palace earlier this year. More than a hundred people were shot. It seems somewhere from 28 to 40 of them killed. The day of the shooting, February 7, was the day that Andre Rajawelma first declared himself president and sent his freshly anointed alternative prime minister, Munda Rondefo, to seize the presidential palace. When we were on our way to the palace uh, the 7th of February, um, we didn't have any weapon, uh, any uh, even hand weapon. We, we didn't have anything with us. And, uh, were were there rocks or uh, no, 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 or no, no. We, d we didn't have anything at all. And it was like uh, an ambush. It was an ambush for, for to kill us. The red line is uh, just... Andri Ralijon is a senior advisor to the elected president. He was inside the palace gates, looking out as the crowd approached and the presidential guard opened fire. So they were running towards the palace. Yeah. So For Andri Ralijon, the blood is not on the hands of his president, but on those of the opposition for urging the crowd into such an assault. With the video I'm going to show you. We can, we can see for ourselves, huh? Exactly. Of all the footage from that day, none clearly shows the moment of the shooting until Andri reveals this clip. It's never been broadcast. See, there is a movement. The militaries are starting to step back. He presents it to show that the crowd weren't just chanting slogans, but were surging towards the gate, scattering police and army before them. He's correct, it does show that, but it also shows a response that is staggering in its ferocity. He doesn't know it yet, but Andri Ralijon is not just watching bodies fall, he's watching the fall of his government. Until February, the battle between the president and Rajuelma looked like a personal one. A battle between two rich guys that turned sour when Rajuelma had one of his TV stations shut down and some of the president's businesses were burnt down in retaliation. 
But now, since the massacre at the palace, Rajawelma has found a theme for the common man. The anger over the killings is palpable throughout the city. But now it's early March and Rajawelma has been having day-long protests every day for two weeks. The crowds are waning and the city seems to be growing weary of Rajawelma and his constant claim that he is the president. Businesses big and small are tiring of the rallies and the looting that often breaks out after them, many of them now declaring their support for the government. <laughs> Rajawelma is clearly a worried man. Now the crowds get no more than glimpses of him behind his hired muscle. He's extremely media shy and seems to be becoming paranoid. He believes mercenaries are out to capture and kill him and I'm told he thinks I'm one of them. Frankly, his movement looks like it's about to fizz out until, ironically, the government comes to his rescue with a crackdown. The military are blockading you know, the entrance for all the demonstrators. Oui, on veut aller là-bas, mais on a deux barrages là, avec des armes à feu. Le peuple malga s'ouvre. C'est une dictature qui est là. Blocking off the city square and parading a newly formed and equipped riot squad doesn't seem to be winning any hearts and minds. If anything, it just helps rejuvenate the opposition. Having seized the centre of town, police fan out, firing tear gas at any groups in their path. Protesters, workers or shoppers, hardly endearing anyone to the government's cause. <laughs> We've just been uh, gassed again. It's pretty effective uh, crowd control. Dispersing the crowds is just part of the government's strategy to regain control. Seizing the leaders of the opposition is the other part of the crackdown, as presidential advisor Andrei Ralijan explains. They are guilty of coup attempt, they are guilty of organizing looting, so for us it's very clear. Yeah. They are preparing a kidnapping uh, against us, and, uh, but well, it does not change our determination. It's the last I will see of Munja Rondefo for four days. Calls start to come in that troops are looking for him and he'll soon go into hiding. And that night, his leader will follow. Most of, most of the After a tip-off, my fixer Gilo and I head out to Andre Rajawelna's home. We've heard that special forces have surrounded it and are about to attack. It's a little bit strange. We're just at the top of uh, Andre Rajalina's uh, driveway, or the entrance to his um, compound. So we're a bit wary about walking in at the moment because his own guards are uh, heavily armed. Um, and if we walk in at this uh, time of night, which is a curfew, um, we're probably just as likely to be shot by them as we are to be shot by the army if we uh, suddenly uh, turn up. His compound was attacked, but Rajawelma managed to escape. He'll disappear for the next 11 days. It's rumoured that he's left the country. The crackdown has been going on now for three days. 
With the city locked down, protests have moved to the suburbs and the university. The riot squad have followed, and it seems they're starting to fire more than just gas canisters. Oh, here we have something like uh, 5,000 uh, students staying in this campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, the dormitories at the top of the hill give a prime view as the troops sweep through the streets below. One of the protesters is shot. Another, a 23-year-old law student, is killed as she watches the affray from her dormitory room. Her death in particular, the innocent bystander, sparks a rumbling of discontent within the police and army. Journalists begin to gather outside a military compound when a rumour spreads that officers there are going to issue a statement condemning civilian deaths. That little stirring is soon squashed by senior commanders. I'll ask you to, to uh, get away from here, you will go down there, because we, no statement will be given to you. But in a side alley just off the base, we stumble across an animated group of soldiers and junior officers. We're chased off, but as the meeting gathers steam, they're no longer talking in whispers. I think they are saying something like, like strong. No more orders from the from our chief. Yeah. We don't want anything from, from the president anymore. It's a real rebellion. So they are rousing and they say, let's go now. So it looks like a coup. Looks like a coup. Within minutes of the meeting breaking up, two pickups loaded with soldiers roar off in the direction of the main military base in the city. We follow. But they're fully armed and uh, they're off on a mission of some sort. They might be going to another uh, military camp. Yeah. These two carloads of armed emissaries are either about to meet their death or, if they reach their destination unopposed, sow the seeds to bring down a government. Let me out. I'm uh, just getting out of here. The soldiers just got out, all armed themselves and took defensive positions. Everyone's running. No shots are fired at them, and after a brief standoff at the gates, they're allowed into the base where it appears the message of their rebellion is well received. Are the chiefs of staff meeting here? Technically, the mutiny never spreads beyond this base, but from this moment on, the government of President Ravalo Manana is doomed. Just anyone, one uh, officer, ask if the chief to start the meeting. Ask if the chief. Andri Rajawelna remains in hiding, but his protest movement springs to life again under the leadership of his alternate prime minister. Munja Rondefa. The position of the broader army is still vague. The whole organisation now appears paralysed with indecision. But over the next few days, it becomes clear that at least 50 soldiers are openly on side. That's enough for the entire alternate ministry to emerge from hiding. But now you're back. You've come back. We come yeah, back. Come back. <laughs> and, uh... No, we, we are very confident. Roger Wellner's Minister for Education and his Minister for New Technology, no longer on the run, but driving through town with armed guards. Their claims to power no longer appear grandiose. Their titles no longer absurd. Uh, the, the God is with us. God with you, yeah. That is God is with us. Uh, it's very miraculous. Yeah. What a difference God and 50 guns can make. Presidential advisor Andri Ralijon appears to have vacated his office at the palace when I dropped by, but he's still taking calls and hoping for the best. I think, legally speaking, we still have uh, some options. 
uh, I do not believe that all the forces are really with those, are, are supporting those illegal acts. Yes. Um, it's, um, at this point, I don't know what to tell you. I, I just know that there are some options, but um, are you day that goes by, the options are getting slimmer. Over the next few days, the Minister for Defence suffers the ignominy of being locked in a military base until he agrees to resign. The crowd moves to seize the Ministry of Finance with police and army standing by. Other ministries and officers empty out as the wings of the government start to fall one by one. It's said that uh, the, the, the mob has, uh, has gone to the Prime Minister of uh, Palace to, to take it over. Yeah. So we, we want to check because here there are lots of uh, uh, news uh, happening so we are checking it uh, if it's really happening now. Uh, well, it seems that the rumour may indeed be true. I've just had a phone call from the uh, transitional or alternate uh, Prime Minister who tells me he's uh, heading with his people over to the Prime Minister's official office uh, right now. That can only mean uh, one thing. He's there to uh, take power. Uh, by force or by uh, other means. We'll soon find out. This is the palace, right? This is, this the, is the palace, yeah. This is the seat of power here, really, right? That's right, yeah. That's yeah. the Prime Minister Palace. No trouble from the army, then? No trouble from the army. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> the army unit protecting the serving Prime Minister have stepped aside as Munja and his group of mutineers have swept into the palace. It's exactly a week since Munja went into hiding. The serving Prime Minister hands in his resignation and hands over the palace to Munja in a ceremony that is as brief as it is silent. Can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The soldiers who have just let this takeover happen seem a little stunned. The handover may have been fast and simple, but it is totally complete. Four days ago, four days ago, I was uh, oh, yeah, trying to find you. You were in hiding. Yeah. Sure. And uh, now you're prime minister. Yeah. Did you think it would be this quick? Well, I've already, uh, I've already foreseen it. <laughs> but did you think this week? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, His supporters may be happy, but Mundur and Defo is not celebrating yet. The standoff at the palace was the first direct confrontation between his troops and those still loyal to the president. His triumph could equally have been a bloodbath and a counter-attack could still lie on the road ahead. You seem quite uh, tense, quite anxious. Me? Yes. No? Yes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking too much. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the charge of the office, you know. And, uh, well, you, we are still in crisis, you know? Yes, it's not over yet. We are still in crisis, uh, so it's a handover of power in crisis. <laughs> the military are still saying that they're neutral. In essence, they won't attack the president, but it's clear they won't defend him either. That task falls to crowds of supporters who are gathering outside his home on the outskirts of town where the president has bunkered down. Some are here to defend and support Ravalo Manana. Others come to defend the position and the constitution from an illegal power grab. If this is Ravalo Manana's last line of defence, then bloodshed is inevitable. Either his or a crowd armed with little more than bravado. Ravalo Manana hits the airwaves with a rare public address. His olive branch is too little, too late for Roger Wellner's alternate ministry, who are now out in force.
and they're in no mood to be negotiating with Ravalo Manana now that they have him on the ropes. The church and the UN are pushing for peace talks, but the alternate finance minister bluntly states the position they're now in. There's no turning back now that promises have been made to the military. If there was ever any doubt that the opposition's plan was to totally seize power, there's none now. And it's a plan that is now openly condemned by many international ambassadors, to the surprise and annoyance of Mundurondefo. They have never condemned any of the act of Mr. Mark Ravalumanana. These representatives being who, sir? The American Embassy, oh, yes. the European Union uh, representative here. I think the, uh, the international concern at least is uh, you're creating a lot of uh, trauma in this country. Uh, and it's not exactly democratic because you know, this president is mid-term. Mid yeah, it, it, it depends on how you view what is a turmoil. His troops is crushing down the people, chasing the people into the, 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 their houses and the, the students into their rooms. The international community has never condemned it. So what is this? Until now, the army have maintained they would not actively attack the president, holding to a technical stance that their actions were neither mutinous nor a coup. Those semantics are dropped today. The army is ready to go to the palace and um, take the, the president out. They're ready to go. They're ready to go because they couldn't stand up anymore. They couldn't bear waiting for, for a long time. Within minutes of this announcement, city streets start to be blocked off. And as I make my way towards the palace downtown, soldiers can be seen flitting in the shadows. That's the, uh, the president's office is at the end of the street um, behind me, coincidentally. It's also where my hotel is. Uh, I've just come from the press conference where the army uh, officially announced they are now turning on the, uh, on the president. And they haven't said that to, uh, to date. Uh, true to their word, it's about 15 minutes later um, and the uh, soldiers are taking up position uh, here. It was down this street just the month before that Rajawalna's supporters ran to their death trying to storm the palace gates. Now Rajawalna has tanks at his disposal. It's unclear how the palace guard will respond this time. a lot of firing. I don't know if it's return fire or they're just firing into the building at the moment. This is the exact spot where uh, 30 people were gunned down here about a month ago. And it looks like uh, a vengeance is, uh, is being served today. Within 15 minutes, the palace has fallen. This is the uh, office I was in uh, just over a week ago, uh, watching the, uh, the video or the government's account of what happened on uh, February 7. Things have changed. Like presidents before him, the end of Ravalamana's reign is marked with soldiers' boots in the hallways and his portrait off the wall. A bit of brickwork and some scary blessings. And the palace is fit for its new king. With a bit of pomp, but not much ceremony, Rajawelna and his ministry swear themselves in. 
A few months ago, most of the world viewed Rajawelna as the successful leader of a movement for democratic change. With troops at his side and declaring that elections may not be held for another two years, that tag sits a little uneasily on his shoulders today.